Shalom, my bitches. My end is here at NFY bringing you When Death Worlders Visit, Part 1, by Andrew's Second Account. My gentlemen, I think this was a terrible idea, Aranis whispered, her breath tickling Stephen's ear. She pulled at the fabric covering her face. This stuff is obviously useless. I might as well take it all off and start killing the aliens now. He turned slightly to see her grasping at her ornate veil of purple silk, its metallic sequined trim catching his eye as she leaned into his personal space. He raised an eyebrow as their gazes locked momentarily. She seemed bright-eyed and in good humor, smiling even, but there might have been a hint of seriousness in there somewhere. He wouldn't stop her from tearing it off if she wanted. Disguising their true biology was useful, though not strictly necessary. Eventually, the aliens would find out the truth anyway. Stephen wore a simple charcoal suit, a red tie, and a white shirt. His shoes were in the loafer style, made of black synthetic leather, polished to a shine. A pocket square and a so scent lapel pin completed his attire. In addition to her veil, she wore a hood of the same material, covering her hair and the rest of her head. Her eyes and the bridge of her nose remained as the only parts of her body left exposed. From the neck down, she had selected what might have been a cross between a full-length lady's evening gown and a priest's cassock in a calming shade of lavender. A decorative swirling pattern ran in two broad parallel lines from her shoulders down the front of her chest and along the sides of her legs before ending at the hem of her dress, suspended scant millimeters from the ground. She had insisted on wearing sandals rather than covering her feet or toes in confining shoes, and appropriately long attire had been required to conceal them. It would not do to have her pedicured claws visible for all the station personnel to see. Although armor and leathers, not formal dress, were more her style, to Stephen, she looked absolutely stunning. She was the very picture of how an exotic Nixian duchess such as herself ought to appear, veil and hood notwithstanding. Unfortunately, as her duke, he had been threatened with having to wear much the same attire at formal functions, only opting out of that honor thanks to his Air Force dress whites. Nixian clothing was largely unisex, much to his dismay. Both their outfits had been interwoven with all manner of sensor shielding and communications technology, of course. She sighed softly before returning to sitting straight in her chair. Their hosts had seated the pair on one side of an empty metallic table of utilitarian design inside a large, white, featureless room. An equally plain and locked door faced them. The aliens hadn't explained to Stephen and Aranus why they had been pulled out of the spaceport's entry screening area and escorted here, only that there was some confusion that needed to be resolved before they would be granted their visas. Stephen could guess exactly what the confusion was, and he was looking right at her. Not that this was in any way his wife's fault, "'You're not being very diplomatic, Ambassador,' he chided her, although he did agree with her sentiment in principle. Chosen for their unique experience with the aliens, the odd husband and wife pair, an ambassador and her special assistant, were the public faces of an entire team of scientists, anthropologists, military personnel, diplomats, and others— from the four races tasked with a simple mission. They were to establish some form of diplomatic relations with the organization known as the Galactic Community, whether officially or unofficially, on behalf of the so sent Confederation. At the moment, it appeared like this mission was at the edge of a precipice. If things kept going in this direction... The best they could hope for was a swift return to their courier ship, with their tails metaphorically, in their particular cases, between their legs. In the worst case, this could end in a fight to the death. 
neither of the pair would allow themselves to be captured alive again. The operational phase of the plan had started out carefully and safely as possible. Their ship, the Hadrian, had sent a transmission via quantum entanglement to a Confederation drone of Terran manufacture positioned a few light minutes from the Galactic Community Trading Hub, orbiting an unassuming F2V star in a nondescript system. That drone had then retransmitted the message to the massive station, after which formal introductions had begun. The diplomatic protocols had been agreed upon, including the size of the courier vessel, the weapons it could mount, number of its crew and diplomatic staff, and dozens of other details, whether in Portland, merely customary, or otherwise. Prior to getting even that far, it had taken some months of debate between Confederation factions to agree how best to proceed with the diplomatic outreach mission. Ultimately, they had decided on a single ship with a diverse group of specialists and a contingent of specially trained fighters from both Earth and Nyx. Even that portion of the planning had begun only after some serious deliberation on whether or not any of the Confederation species would seek diplomatic recognition with the galactic community in the first place. Alerting the GC to the location of Federation worlds posed a serious risk, namely the possibility of complete destruction of those worlds, planetary shielding notwithstanding. There had been very real thought put into never bothering with it at all, or alternately moving towards a preemptive strike. Setting aside the wisdom of starting a galactic war where victory was far from certain, most knowledgeable individuals agreed that, unfortunately, simply ignoring the galactics or hiding in place just wasn't an option. Anyone with a telescope could see that the Confederation worlds held water, existed in habitable zones, and had ample supplies of atmospheric oxygen that didn't diminish into oxides over time. Added to that were the Aloth. They inhabited colony swarms in orbit around every Confederation star, first constructed from the remnants of their old flotilla, but later expanded upon by plentiful resources. No amount of quiet technology could completely prevent that much infrared byproduct. All these glaring road signs pointed to the presence of life within the SOSENT systems, if one only chose to look. Unfortunately, actively looking in the right direction might not even be necessary for most observers. While Nix hadn't advanced far enough along to alert the galaxy to their presence before being given quiet tech, or any tech for that matter, their world had been charted by the galactic community long ago. Garakoth, on the other hand, had taken great pains to shield their emissions from its founding, so they might be safe. Similarly, Sirik Naj would be safe, but only because it had ceased to exist as anything but a pile of ash. The victim of matter accelerated to near light speed. Earth, however, was in the most precarious situation of the four races. The human homeworld had been actively broadcasting their technological capabilities in real time for about two centuries. Recently, they had even used primitive warp technology of their own design, spewing a month's worth of gravity field distortions at the speed of light, before quiet drives had been hastily assembled and delivered from Garakoth shipyards. They had immediately been made mandatory for use, but the damage had already been done. The nearest galactic outpost was seven light years away from the first Terran use of old warp technology, but that had been six years ago. Aranis and Steven would represent the SoSent Confederation on its own terms, rather than leaving it up to some surprise on a technician's detection equipment. Though the plan that led to their current predicament had been agreed to unanimously by all the territories of the four races, that did not mean the entire confederation would be revealed to the Galactics. Their Shalkoths of Garakoth and the Eloth refugees would remain silent partners for the time being, at the request of their territory's respective leaders, 
understandably so. Aranis smirked at her husband. I can't help it if the aliens disgust me. Besides, I'm a diplomat, she said. Therefore, everything I say is diplomatic. He rolled his eyes. Though he couldn't tell for sure, he knew that a dozen sharp teeth would have been just visible between her lips as they parted into a smile. Half diplomat, half spy. He knew that deep down she took her job very seriously. Of course, that didn't necessarily mean she was good at it, knew how to do it well, or wouldn't revert back to her previous occupation in a heartbeat if she felt the situation warranted it. Hating all aliens is diplomatic, he asked. When a diplomat does it, yes, she replied, using the human nodding gesture. They're big, ugly, condescending, rude, unladylike, vile, wicked, have no respect for individual liberty, are terribly narcissistic, I could go on. Oh, no need to hold back. Tell me how you really feel, he said. In all honesty, he felt the same. Their opinions differed only in that he preferred not to talk about them, while his wife had a way with words when she complained about the aliens. As an added bonus, his translator always supplied her with an exotic accent that Stephen found wonderfully adorable. Starting a conversation in one of the subjects that held her passion, just to hear her go on about it, even rambling, counted among his most guilty pleasures in life. And she seemed to enjoy it immensely, too. Oh, I will, she said, as soon as we get back to the ship. I hope you guys enjoyed that one. If you did, go ahead and leave a like, subscribe, and hit the bell on the side. If you didn't, let me know. I'm looking to uh, figure out how to improve. Uh, hopefully the pop filter worked. And also, I shifted the uh, mic down a couple of inches so that it wasn't in the direct path of my reading. So hopefully it didn't get the brunt of all of the uh, diphthongs. I think that's what they're called. Anyways, have a nice one, y'alls.